So we are continuing our She series, and uh, the last week uh, we, we saw the S was significant, and we, we saw that uh, Jim J kind of continued the series, and I heard it was an amazing discussion. Um, as we got started, we, we started the whole thing off with, with this series idea, and this is what we're kind of unfolding as we go on throughout the weeks. We said that Jesus is a man women can follow because he reveals the worth of women to the world. And, and we talked about this and how he does this with, with women and the interactions of Jesus and women that we find in the gospel accounts. Uh, but we said that, that ultimately Jesus was using his relationship with these women to reveal their worth. And we said that there's a difference between ascribed worth and intrinsic worth. And scribed, ascribed worth is kind of how throughout history people operated of attributing worth and value to people based on what they produce or based on what they reproduce. And, and, and we we saw that Jesus kind of, he, he tipped the scales in another way. He said, no, 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 uh, you're, you're, you have value because you're made in the image of God. You're a human being made in the image of God. You are loved by God. You have value intrinsically. And we, we said that this kind of changed everything. And Jesus used the women in his life to kind of tilt the scale here. So we've been unfolding this. And, and, and Jim Dre said last week, he said that Jesus is a man women can follow because he cares for them through grace and recognition. And again, the grace and recognition of Jesus is available for everyone, but we saw how he interacted with women to do this. And so this week we're going to talk about, not just significant, but the H in she, honored. And, and this is, to me, as I was preparing this talk, this is just, I had so much fun preparing this. I, I really dove into this story, and uh, a lot of this was prepped, and again, this wasn't Jim Dre and I sitting around as a, as a couple guys trying to figure out what was going on in women's heads. We actually, we had a group of women that I was able to sit down with one night and take out to dinner, and, and man, we said free dinner, and they just ordered it up. It was awesome. Uh, we had a whole spread of food. It was great, and we just asked questions. We just ask questions about these stories and these interactions. And, and so a, a lot of the information and a lot of the things that, that are coming out of this series is because we were able to sit with some women and, and, and hear their thoughts and their reactions to these interactions of Jesus and women. And, and so I, I was very excited as I looked through those notes and was preparing all of this um, because I think this is an important week. I think this is an important message. I think this is an important interaction for all of us. Uh, in the room. And so we're going to talk about honor, but most of us understand what honor is. We understand the definition is high respect as for worth, merit, or rank, high public esteem, fame, and glory. Basically, honor boils down to two things, rank and reason. When we honor someone in society and in our culture, it usually has to do with some kind of position Right or some kind of action, something that they did. We just we just talked about maybe an award that you won. I just found out someone at my table won the Australian Oscars, basically for male leading role. Yeah, so meet somebody. You never know what you might find out. Uh, but that, that's how we honor people, right? It's based on rank or reason, and we understand this. We get this. But again, Jesus, because he was he was tipping the scale on value, he begins to change the way we view honor and respect. And he has this amazing interaction with this woman while at this, this, this seemingly important man's house. And I want to look into this story and I want to see how Jesus, he, he says, listen, like sure, we can honor people based on, on rank and, and reason and things they, they, they do and accomplish and achieve. That, that's fine. But he also is going to, again, tip the scale on how we view honor and respect. So let's look here in Luke uh, chapter 7. And we, we've come through all these stories have come from Luke. Luke was a guy, he was actually a doctor, a uh, very intelligent man, and he had uh, collected these interviews of people who were around at the time of Jesus. And I, I think that this story actually came from, uh, my, my best guess would be he interviewed the guy whose house he was at. Because I think we're, we're going to see an insight here that maybe this only this guy would have. And again, that's pure speculation, but I think from the point of view here, um, that it was possibly Luke interviewing the man whose house he was at. His name was Simon. So he says, one of the Pharisees, again, his name is Simon, we're going to learn that later, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. And so this Pharisee, and Pharisees were like, like the religious elite of the day, okay? Like they were the guys, and they were good. They, throughout the Gospels, they gave Jesus a hard time, and so like in Christian world, we kind of give them a hard time because they gave Jesus a hard time, and they tried to argue with them a lot, and they were wrong, and all that good stuff. But these guys, like 
a lot of times they, they were they knew the the religious law and they had a passion to live it out. Now, sometimes how they lived that out was not the best way, but they did have a passion to live that out. And so this guy, Simon, he had actually had leprosy, which was a, a, a very degenerative disease, and he had been healed of that. We're not exactly told how he was healed of that, but we do know that he at some point had leprosy. And so he's been healed from that, and he's restored back to his status within the community, and he has Jesus over to dinner with him. So, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And now when they would do this, uh, they, they reclined at the table. It's almost like sitting on the floor. Maybe you've been to a foreign country where, where they, they sit kind of on the floor, which is very difficult for a big guy like me when I was in Japan. My feet would always fall asleep. Um, but a, t- a lot of times they, they would recline and kind of have their feet back behind them. Uh, it says, when a certain immoral woman, how would you like that to be how people knew you, uh, from that city heard he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Now, this alabaster jar was basically this, this stone, this, this marble that would have been carved out and would have had uh, uh, some kind of perfume inside of it. And, and, and the, how they got the perfume in there was, was pretty amazing because this jar could only really be used once. It wasn't like a, a screw-off top. They would actually have to break the jar open to let out the, the oil, basically, that was in there that was used as the the perfume. This was very expensive. It was about one year's fair wages is what this would have cost. So this woman had this very expensive perfume in this very expensive jar that could only be used once. And, and a lot of times people in wealthier families, they would have this, and this would be for their wedding day, right? It was used once. This was a very special occasion. It was used uh, probably more for their wedding day and their wedding night. And, and it was used once. And so she had this, and she was known as an immoral woman, and so her reputation uh, certainly tarnished in this community. I mean, she had this very expensive thing. She, she may have even come from a very well-to-do family to have something like this. But her reputation was not well-to-do anymore. And so she comes in, she has this alabaster jar, this, this marble jar, and she breaks it open. And inside she has this perfume that, that was called spikenard or nard or musgroup. And basically, we got any essential oils people in here? Anyone love essential? This is what it was. It was an amber-colored essential oil that came from, like, Nepal, China, India area. And so if you're a believer in essential oils, it goes all the way back to these times, ancient times. Uh, and it was used as a perfume and medicine and in some religious context. So she breaks this open, and she begins uh, to use this. With Jesus says, then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, and this is why I think that it was him who was interviewed, because it tells us what he said to himself. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. This is what he says to himself, but Jesus, being very perceptive, says, then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. And that's what Jesus would do a lot of times, right? Like somebody would have an issue, and he would tell a story. And it would just like help relate that issue. I, I really wish I had this gift. <laughs> he says, a man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And what Jesus is doing in this story, and I don't think Simon really gets this right away, but what he's doing is saying, you and the woman who you're judging here, you're, you're actually not as far apart as you think. He continues. Then he turned to the woman, this is Jesus, and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, which would have been customary specifically if you consider the person who you are having at your home as an equal or greater than you. So he's basically saying, you, you disrespected me right away. But she's washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You, you didn't greet me with a kiss. This wouldn't have been on the lips. This would have been on the cheek. 
I, I don't know if maybe you've been in cultures where this is, is uh, a thing to kiss on the cheeks when you greet someone. Um, I did not grow up in a culture like that, and I went to a culture like that, and I didn't know what was happening. And I thought the person was leaning in to tell me something because the room was loud. And so I, I, I put my ear right on her lips. <laughs> Um, as she was trying to just say welcome and kiss me on the cheek. It was very embarrassing. Um, he said, you didn't do this, but from the, the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. You see, he's saying you guys are the same. You're not that far off. And when I came in, you disrespected me, and she showed me an incredible amount of honor. You dishonored me. She respected me in an incredibly humble, and I want to say vulnerable way. One of the things that that the the ladies that we talked to as we were uh, looking into this passage, one of the things that was commented on was how she pushed through her shame and became incredibly vulnerable in that moment. And that that was really what connected her to Jesus, was pushing through her shame and becoming vulnerable. And if you want to talk about shame and vulnerability, you, you got to look at, at a lady named Brene Brown. And so I want to give you just a piece of her TED Talk from 2010, where she's going to talk a little bit about what I think we can look into, into this story in a really, really important way. <laughs> you know this. So I could tell you a lot about shame, but I'd have to borrow everyone else's time. But here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. Um, And this this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. My one year turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data. Um, and six years, and I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. Um, And what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness, They have a sense, a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging, and have a strong, and really struggle for it, and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. And to me, the hard part of the one thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection was something that personally and professionally I felt like I needed to understand better. So, I think this is an incredibly important part as we continue to look at the She Series and we look at honor. Is this right here and what she said. Jesus is a man women can follow because he brings belonging to the broken. There's no way this woman didn't believe she belonged with Jesus, and we're not even done with this interaction, right? She pushed through shame and vulnerability to say, I belong here with Jesus. And Jesus is going to do something for her that is just going to change the game. And I think he does the same thing for us. And I think that it's incredibly important, and and I've been praying all week that each and every one of us would look into ourselves and not just separate and look at this story from a distance, but look at this story and how it relates to our life and how Jesus brings belonging to the broken. When we come to Jesus in a vulnerable faith, he shows us we belong. When we get vulnerable, when we open ourselves up, when we show our brokenness to him, to to maybe somebody else who's in relationship with him, when we begin to open up, we find that we already have everything that we've ever wanted, that it's there, it's available, it's accessible to us in Jesus. So let's continue to look at the story of Jesus and this woman. 
He's continuing to talk to Simon. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many. He's, Jesus didn't deny who she was. He didn't deny her reputation. He said, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Right? In Jesus, they're forgiven. He said, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. He's saying, hey, listen, you may be that guy that on the outside you get it right more often than you get it wrong. And she may be someone who gets it wrong more than she gets it right. But you both need forgiveness. You both need it. No one's above it. No one's better than the need for forgiveness. So then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? How dare he, right? This was a thing for God to do. Like, who is this guy? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She comes to him in this vulnerable faith. He says, that vulnerability, that faith, that trust in me has saved you. And then he gives that word, go in peace. And, and a lot of times the, the, the word peace there in the Jewish culture was shalom. We, we misunderstand that. We, we look at peace as an absence of conflict. And that's, that's not really what he said. What he was saying to her is, is go in wellness, go in wholeness, go in fullness. Go in being, you are a complete person now. That's huge. And we see here that there's two ways that Jesus brings belonging to the broken. And I want to tell you that if you're broken today, and we all are at some level, there is a belonging. And what Brene Brown was talking about was was when you believe that you belong. When you believe you're worthy. And in Jesus, we can all believe that we are worthy. The things that we really want, we already have because of Jesus. We begin, it begins to change our life completely. And Jesus brings us belonging Through forgiveness. He says you're forgiven. Whenever you talk about forgiven, we all we all feel it deeply, right? There's that place where you've needed to be forgiven and someone's forgiven you well. And you know how how deeply that that connected your relationship. There's forgiveness that you need from somebody that they won't give. Right? And and then and then there's the forgiveness in yourself that you've never given to somebody else. When we talk about forgiveness. We're talking about something that's deep, deeply rooted inside of us. Maybe there's an area where there's some forgiveness that you need in your life. Maybe you've never even forgiven yourself. And in Jesus, you can come to him and he says, no, 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 you're forgiven. Because of me, you're forgiven. My life, my death, my resurrection, you are forgiven. This brings forgiveness. This is what I'm here for, to heal you and to forgive you. She needed to hear you're forgiven. He honored her by saying, you're forgiven. You are loved. But also through fullness. Again, this word shalom. This completeness. Maybe you feel empty. Maybe because of your brokenness, something is just is leaking out of you and, and life is leaving you. And you're like, I don't understand why. I don't understand what's wrong. It might be because you've never grasped onto the forgiveness of Jesus so much so that it begins to heal that brokenness and you begin to be filled with life again in a way that connects you to the world around you and to who you truly are. I imagine when this woman left, her life was totally different. I imagine she was healed in a way that we could never imagine. And what we see here ultimately is this, 360-degree honor. What Jesus was trying to show this guy is, you see, what we're doing here, me, me and this lady that you, that you just dismiss, we're honoring each other here. You've dishonored me. You've disrespected me. You disrespected her. But we're going to have this mutual respect, this mutual honor with each other. That's what Jesus provides. Imagine if we could look around the table with people who aren't like us. They don't look like us. They don't think like us. Maybe they don't even believe like us. And we sit around the table here at Downtown Faith, and we just, we just show them the respect they deserve, again, because of the value that they have intrinsically because they are made in the image of God, and they are loved by God, and Jesus died for them. And resurrected so that they can have forgiveness and fullness. What if 
we had that kind of respect. It wasn't based on, on gender. It wasn't based on rank. It wasn't based on reason. It's just, it's just I'm going to love you. I'm going to respect you. I'm going to honor you, even when I disagree with you, even when I don't understand you. I'm going to respect you. Jesus modeled this 360 respect. And then look what happens. In Mark, we see this same story. Jesus has to correct some other people at the table. It's a different interaction. It's not with Simon. It's with some other people. But he tells everyone in the room, he says, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news, this word gospel, this announcement of Jesus is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. He honored her so much so that she carries this legacy with her. And guess what? He was right. Right? Like, he was right. We're, we're remembering and discussing her today. As a matter of fact, that's what we're going to discuss. And like I said earlier, don't, let's not discuss it from just this objective view of this woman's story in ancient times. Let's connect it to us. Because I think we all are broken. I think we all need belonging. We all need to continue believing that Jesus has given us the belonging and the worthiness and the value that we need to connect to other people in a meaningful way and live life to the fullest. Jesus is a man women can follow because he brings belonging to the broken.